welcome to Unstoppable. While this show is usually about sports, it is also about members of the GW community. And this month, our community has suffered two terrible losses. On March 8th, junior Antonella Galindo, and on March 10th, senior Charles Poor. I didn't have the privilege of knowing Antonella, but I'm sure I speak for everyone at GW when I say she'll be dearly missed. As for Charlie, there's so much that I could say. I've known him for the last two years and can confidently say I'll never meet another person like him. In their honor, please join us in observing a moment of silence. Thank you. And to all of Antonella's and Charlie's friends and family, our thoughts and prayers are with you. Now to Brittany Lavecchia and Emma Grace Myers, who have the latest on GW Sports. Thanks, Alex. Coming up later on today's show, Mark, Spencer, and Zach break down the NFL, and Sarah and Taya have the latest on F1. Also coming up, Unstoppable's March Madness Breakdown and Top Plays with Rami and Issa. But first, it's time for the rundown. GW's softball team is currently on a four-game win streak and has won eight of their last nine games. Their last two wins have been in dominant fashion, with a 9-0 win over Towson and a 10-0 win against Hofstra. Graduate student Maggie Greco leads the team in RBIs this season and had three in those games. The team has a 15-12 record so far and is 2-1 in conference play. They'll travel to Dayton this weekend to take on the Flyers in a three-game series. GW men's basketball concluded their season at the A-10 tournament against LaSalle last week. Despite leading for over 32 minutes, the team lost by just one point with a final score of 61-60. GW held a 60-59 lead in the final minute after Darren Buchanan Jr. scored a three-pointer, but after a pair of GW fouls, LaSalle's Jameer Vrykas scored two points to win the game. Three revolutionary players have been selected for the A-10 All-Conference team. Fabatunde Akimbola earned recognition on the All-Defensive team. Darren Buchanan Jr. was selected to the All-Rookie team. And James Bishop was named to the All-Conference third team. Looking ahead for Bishop, the senior guard earned a spot on the National Association of Basketball Coaches All-District 4 second team. Bishop ends his revolutionary's career with 2,103 points in 111 games, ranking third in all-time pro program history. The GW women's basketball team finished off their season with a 75-68 loss to St. Louis at the A-10 Championships in Henrico, Virginia. GW maintained a five-point lead in the fourth quarter, but St. Louis closed the game on a 19-7 run to win. The team ended their season with a final record of 13-18. Senior Nia Robertson finished off her college career with 15 points and three rebounds, while sophomore Nia Robertson scored a game high of 23 points. Grad student Maiwo Taiwo grabbed a team high 11 boards. Taiwo is GW's all-time leader in games played with 135 total. She ends her career with 1,037 rebounds, which is third in program history. The women's lacrosse team has had a rocky start to this season and currently sit at 3-8 overall. Their last game, a loss against St. Joseph's, was a lopsided affair with a score of 20-6. Graduate student Emma Nowakowski leads the team so far this season with 28 goals, followed by Desiree Kleberg with 21. The team will continue conference play next week with a game against Davidson on the 24th and George Mason on the 30th. The GW Gymnastics team accumulated 196 points, placing third on senior night at the Smith Center this week. This comes two days after the team scored an all-time program record of 197.2 in Towson. Senior Kendall Whitman scored a career high with a 9.825 on bars, while senior Peyton Lynch scored a career high of 9.875 on the floor. As the team prepares for the Eagle Championships in Towson, it was announced that 15 GW gymnasts were named to the 2024 All East Atlantic Gymnastics League Scholastic Team. To receive this honor, gymnasts must maintain a GPA of 3.0 or above throughout the 2023 academic year. That's all for the rundown. Up next, Mark Spencer and Zach break down a crazy NFL free agency.
Welcome in to the Frontline Gridiron Edition. I'm Zach Brody, joined alongside two for the first time, Mark Achkar, Spencer Sachs. We're excited to bring you all the NFL free agency coverage today. There sure has been a lot, and Spencer, we'll start with you. So much has gone on in the past few weeks. Give me your top move of free agency so far. Well, I got to say, you know, Keenan Allen's the Bears, I think is the definitive signing that will really show how good the Bears are. And we saw an interesting team last year. We saw a 6-7 win team last year with Justin Fields coming with Caleb Williams. Let's go. Um, and I really think, though, that Keenan Allen, you know, pro bowler, been a long time with uh, the Chargers, both in Los Angeles and in San Diego. This is a dude who's going to come in who will have a, a veteran presence in their wide receiver room, a veteran presence for a rookie quarterback. Yep. He will be a captain on this team. He'll be a leader on this offense. He'll be the reason why this offense is good next year. And, you know, with Caleb Williams coming in, they got a great offensive line. They just uh, signed DeAndre Swift from the Eagles. Like, this is going to be an offense that will be competing. And truth be told, I really think it's better than the Packers this year. I think they will be fighting for that number Ooh. two slot wow. in the uh, wow. NFC North. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to say, I want to jump in just because I think – Keenan Allen is such an important figure just in terms of the role he's going to play leadership-wise. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you saw Keenan Allen. He went to the USC Pro Day with Caleb Williams. I feel like that chemistry is already there. And looking at the season, I feel like it could be like that quarterback wide receiver threat that maybe top 10 in the league. We don't know yet. I, I feel think like top five. Top I mean, five? I think I mean, it's going to be a top five. I mean, five. He's, he's getting up there, but when Keenan Allen gets hot, like <laughs> Keenan Allen's a dangerous man. Mark, we'll turn to you. Same question. What is your single biggest move of free agency so far? Yeah, I'm going to go with another wide receiver, Marquise Hollywood Brown. I mean, the guy is named Hollywood for a reason. Just look at his flashiness and speed. Coming off the defending Super Bowl champs in his supposed down year, they led the league in, in drops, and now they add this deep threat. Biggest deep threat since Tyree Kill. I feel that team could be dangerous and pot potentially repeat. This is a team. This is really a team that is going from great to, well, damn, even yeah. greater. <laughs> I mean, like, this is a really a team that – has gotten better. They're coming back with a lot of the same crew. Um, their defense is still great. Like this is this is a team that you know has all the pieces. It's still under the salary cap, if we can even say so, with all their pieces that they yeah. have. Right? They're going to come in with a first rounder Which this year. Which is crazy considering like, <laughs> the salary cap situation around the league. And I mean, it, they're it's they're not, they're number one by <laughs> far every single year. Yeah, they could easily. It's not even close. They could easily run it back, and we'll probably see more Taylor Swift on TV with, with that. Too, yeah, so. more Swifties. Yeah, the NFL. more Swifties. <laughs> That's a really sad commentary to end it off. <laughs> Going overall, I mean, free agency, obviously very important with single moves, but we've also had some teams that have made a few moves that have really, I think, propelled certain teams even to increase their Super Bowl odds. So, again, Spencer, I'll start with you. Give me one team that you think, and try not to be biased here. Give oh, me I mean, one I won't team be, I won't be too that biased. their overall performance have put them in a really sweet position to you know, contend for something big this year. I mean, year. I'm just going to start off. I mean, you know, as a Jet fan, and yes, you know, my dad would say, oh, my God, as you're a such Jet a fan. fan we but might as well leave. This is, this is a team, right, that really has gotten better, and even Vegas has to show. I mean, if you look over here, right, you're going to see that their odds now are plus 3,000. Right? They are 10th highest in the league, right, and it's because of these two guys here, Mike Williams and Tyron Smith. These are two guys – both pro bowlers, both star power players who will come in and make this team better, right? The Jets have always had a big problem with their offensive line, specifically left tackle. Had a lot of big problems. Well, yes, yes. <laughs> you know, VP candidate. But Tyron Smith here, coming in, one-year deal, super cheap, right? He will be a guy who will plug in, could be there for 13 games. His big problem is that he doesn't stay healthy a lot. But uh, this is a guy who will be a pro bowler. He's been a pro bowler every year he's been in the league, which is eight now. He's been – eight pro bowlers in the league, all for the Cowboys. Um, this is a guy who will be the reason why the Jets will be a playoff contender. Mike Williams is the reason why the Jets will win a Super Bowl. I'm going to say that right here, right now. The Jets will win a Super Bowl because of Mike Williams. He will be a dominant factor in this playoffs. Um, but the reason why I say that more so is, you know, the dude already loves being in New York. I mean, he loves the uh, Taylor ham, egg and cheese sandwiches, if you've been following that news. But this is a, a guy who will who will – be right across the field from Garrett Wilson. The big problem the Jets had last year was they didn't have a second wide receiver to draw more coverage from uh, Garrett Wilson. They have that threat now with Mike Williams. His big problem, though, is, again, with injuries. He's coming off an ACL tear in week three this past year. But this is a dude who will come back healthy, will be great, will have a full season, and we got Aaron Rodgers back. Like, this team is going – this team has – the sky is the limit. 
I think they'll be contending for an AFC championship at least. Um, and I think they could run with the division. I think that this division, it got weaker. The Dolphins have gotten weaker. Um, the Bills are up in the air. No one really knows. They had a lot of cap casualties this past year. Right? This is all leading up to a Jets run. Yes, yeah, Spencer, let's see if the Jets can make the playoffs first. I think it's been a fantastic question. It's been 13 years. It's been 13 years. This is the year. Yeah. I mean, at least there's some to say for fandom ship. I don't know what's going on in New York. I mean, at least there's something to say for fandom ship. I don't know what's going on in New York. But, uh, Mark, Mark, I'll give you the same one. It's in the water. One team, multiple moves, better chance for the Super Bowl than they had last year. Yeah, I'm going to go for a pretty long shot here. I'm going to go with the Pittsburgh Steelers. They, they, tr they traded for quarterbacks. They had Russell Wilson and Justin Fields, and they picked up Patrick Queen. And I think this year the only thing tougher than the Pittsburgh Steel is their potential championship defense. Coming in February, I wouldn't be surprised if they were to lift the trophy. I know it's a long shot, but it's not impossible. That's a very long shot. That's so, $7,500 Plus 7,500 odds. 7, odds. <laughs> this is a long shot, but you never know. Adding Russell Wilson, he had 66.8 QBR. I think he's very overhated when he was with the Broncos. He's, he still has a production and, and can still run on his feet, even though he's 35. He ha and looking to Patrick Queen, this is a huge deal for the Steelers. The Steelers in the past haven't had really that linebacker core ever since Shaz Shazier got injured in 2018. They've been killed by tight ends like Travis Kelsey, Mark Andrews, Gronk. And the big plus with Patrick Queen is that he's only 24, and, and he's not even getting paid as much as the top linebackers in the league. And a big plus for that is that they're stealing him from their rival Ravens. So that's like a two for one there. And I mean, you know the Bengals won't be an issue. The <laughs> Bengals, no, I don't know. The Joey, Joe Burrow has to stay healthy. Yeah. But I, mean, I wouldn't also, be surprised if these guys made a huge run. You never know I mean, in the NFL. Factor, though, and Mike Tomlin, I mean, yeah. he, he's not had a losing season in his career with the Steelers, and he's been there for, what, like 15 years at this point? Yeah, consistency with is key. Consistency, so, so potentially they could pop off. I mean, Mike Tomlin is, is honestly one of the most special coaches in the league. I think that's a perfect way to end it off because he's a guy who knows how to win. He has the formula. And uh, I wish your plus 7,500 odds the best of luck. <laughs> That'll do it for us today. Thank you for joining us on the front line. Gridiron edition. We'll catch you next time. Thanks, guys. Changing gears, Sarah and Tia have the latest on the F1 season. Welcome back to GWTV's Formula One coverage. In our last episode, we looked at our predictions and background heading into the 2024 season. I'm Tia. And I'm Sarah. The season is already in motion with two races down and 22 to go. We are here going to be looking at some impressive performances as well as some letdowns from the start of the season. First, let's start off at the Brawl Ring Grand Prix. Let's really, what we really need to talk about is the gap between Max Verstappen and, and literally everybody else on the grid. While it's the first race of the season, fans kind of expected that there would be a bit of a gap because of how we left off last year with Max only losing two races. So we really saw that there was going to be another gap. But with preseason testing, people got a little bit more hopeful because he was really only one or two seconds ahead of everybody else. I mean, yeah. At the end of the race, we saw that there was a 22-second gap between Max Verstappen and Checo. This is insane because this is, this is the difference between um, P1 and P2. So the fact that there's a 22-second gap between P1 and P2, and the rest of the drivers were all way behind Checo as well, um, this is just not boding off well for the start of the season. I mean, this is going to hurt the F1 viewership because it's just going to get very repetitive if it's just – if it's just the same level of dominance from Max Verstappen over and over and over again. Another thing that was interesting that happened in the Bahrain Grand Prix was the 52.4 second pit stop that was um, done by Sig on Botas's car due to a wheel nut issue. And we also saw the same thing happen with a 28 second pit stop on Joe Guanyu's car in the Saudi Arabia Grand Prix. Yeah, it really was crazy because when you think of Formula One, you think the pinnacle of like efficiency and speed and these pit stops can get to under two seconds so having a 52 second pit stop is just insane uh, yeah exactly speaking of interesting things that happened during this race there was a little bit of drama between yuki and ricardo during the race yuki was told by his team to let ricardo pass him because he was in p13 trying to chase kevin magnuson um, but ricardo had fresher tires so the team believed that he had a better chance of getting past magnuson 
Yuki really was not happy with this call, and he initially refused to let Ricardo pass him at all, which obviously ticked off Ricardo. But then once he was actually let through, he wasn't able to actually catch up to uh, Kevin Magnuson. That made Yuki even angrier because then he just gave up his spot for his teammate to not even do anything with it. So during the cool down lap, after the race had finished, Yuki dive bond Daniel Ricardo when going back into the pits and almost caused him to go off the track, which is extremely immature for the sport and quite dangerous. And Daniel very much called it out after. We're really going to have to watch and see how this fallout then carries on through the rest of the season and see how it affects the team's overall strategy. On a better note, Ferrari did end up podium this race, which is great to hear because we do know that last season Leclerc did end up being DNF. We're excited to see how they move on from this and how they do this season. Moving on to the second race, which was the Saudi Arabia Grand Prix, we were excited for that because we saw Ali Behrman, who is an F2 driver. He had his Formula 1 debut due to Carlos Sainz being out for appendicitis surgery, and this is a great start because he had just qualified for pole in the Formula 2 race the day prior. He became the youngest Ferrari driver ever, and he made it into Q2 during quality and finished in P11. And in the, end, in the end during the race, he had an impressive performance with a few overtakes, and he ended up taking home seventh. So moving on to the race happening this weekend it is going to be the Australian Grand Prix. Um, so one interesting thing that is going to happen, as far as we know, is that Logan Sargent will not be driving this weekend as Alex Albon will be taking his car. The reason for this is because Albon damaged his chassis during free practice one and they didn't have a third car available. So that'll do it for Unstoppable's look into Formula One. Next, Zach breaks down a crazy start into March Madness. Welcome in to Unstoppable's breakdown of March Madness. I'm Zach Brody breaking down the reason your bracket is no longer perfect. Because let's be honest, it's not. And factually speaking, out of 20 million ESPN brackets, there are zero perfect after the first round. We're starting off in the south here. First matchup, NC State taking on Texas Tech. But for NC State, it started way back in the ACC tournament where no one thought they would come out on top. As a 10 seed, they beat Duke, then UVA, then the one seed UNC to actually win the ACC championship game and get a bid in March Madness. They come into March Madness as an 11 seed, playing the 6 seed Texas Tech, and the big man DJ Burns was tearing up the floor. Ended with 16 points and an ice cream sundae in his hand. Ben Middlebrooks was also huge. Came off the bench, usually averaging somewhere in the range of 6 points a game. This game, 6 for 8 from the field, 9 for 10 from the free throw line, and 21 points to seal off this win. NC State upsets the Red Riders 80 to 67, and they'll move on to the round of 32. Who will they play next? Well, it's either 14 seed Oakland or 3 seed Kentucky. And spoiler alert, it's not Kentucky. Why not? Largely due to Jack Golke's 10 three pointers. You heard that right. An NCAA record tying 10 threes. Does he look like he's 35 years old? Yes. Does he look like he works a 9 to 5? Also, yes. But can he shoot the lights out? Well, he showed us all what he could do on the floor. Where the Wildcats lie, Kentucky's Antonio Reeves dropped a cool 27, shooting half a buck from three, but it was not enough. Oakland outlives Kentucky, 80-75, your final score. Moving to our third and final upset of the first round. Plenty to talk about, but this one really hurt. Grand Canyon, the 12 seed, defeating five seed St. Mary's. The Lopes pulled out a really team win with four of their starters dropping double digits and Tyson Grant Foster for the Lopes leading all scorers with 22. The Grand Canyon also managed to shut down a strong three-point team to force St. Mary's to an impressive seven from 25 from three-point land. You can see over here St. Mary's going on to the round of 32. Your final score, 75-66. Grand Canyon, moving on. And that will do it for us today. Thank you so much for hanging out with a little March Madness. Wishing you the best of luck on the rest of your bracket, and we'll see you on the flip side. Thanks, Zach. 
I have UNC Chapel Hill winning it. Um, I don't think they're going to, but I'm a Carolina girl, so I had to put my put my weight behind them. Yeah, I have the same actually on my bracket. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, last up for this morning, Rami and Issa have Unstoppable's top plays, March Madness edition. Good morning, GW, and happy Friday. I am so, so excited for today's very special episode of Top Plays. Wait, what's so special about today's episode? I'm so glad you asked, Issa. I thought since it's March, we could do all college basketball in honor of March Madness. What do you think? Ooh, how fun. Well, without further ado, let's jump into number 10. Sounds good with me. Coming in at number 10, Jaden Taylor slips his defender and makes this tough, tough pass to DJ Burns, who then hits the three. NC State has been on a wild run this March, and they would end up winning the ACC tournament and winning in the first round. Let's see how they do in the rest of March Madness. Coming in at number nine, we have UConn against Marquette. Uh, and here we have Tristan Newton passing to Donovan Clagan for a nice two-handed dunk. Amazing. Coming in at number eight, Jackson Shellstad drives in, and it's rejected by Omar Balo. Look at how high he got up in the air for that block. Literally defying gravity, almost a goaltend if you wait a little <laughs> bit longer. But wow. At number seven, we have some great teamwork by Notre Dame. The ball goes from Hidalgo to G. Wolf to Brains Bransford to make the shot and get some nice little points. Of course. Coming in at number six, more Pac-12 action as Larson drives in and another rejection, this time by Joshua Morgan with authority too. Look at how he gets from one side of the lane all the way to the other and swats that to row G. Coming in at number five, Kentucky's Reed Shepard scoring yet another three. He's only a freshman, but man, his talent is undeniable. Yesterday's upset still stings, but uh, I think he will go very, very far. My bracket is busted after that. Coming in at number four is the one, the only, Caitlin Clark for three to ice the game in overtime. So clutch. At number three, we have Vanderbilt's Ayanna Moore bearing a three from the end of the Virginia Tech logo. Ayanna led her team, scoring 22 points. Wow. Coming in at number two, they call him the Japanese Steph Curry. I call him Keisei Tommy Naga. Look at how he pushes off and gets a step back. He has been an absolute sensation to watch this year during his senior year. I'm excited to see how far he can make it in the tournament. He's been my player to watch. Absolutely. Look at how much fun he's having. <laughs> and finally, this week's top play is none other than the buzzer beater finish by South Carolina, who were down by two. Cardoso's shot moved the team into the finals of the SEC tournament, and it was Cardoso's first three of the season, and I think it's going to be a memorable one. Absolutely. What a way to start your three-point shooting exactly. on, a, on a buzzer beater to, to move on. That was absolutely insanity. And that's all for today's episode of March Madness. Best of luck to all your brackets this month. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we will see you next time. Thanks, Rami and Issa. That's it for today's show. Thank you so much for watching. And from all of us here at GWTV, raise high.